Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Wallace Presbyterian Church in Wallace, North Carolina. And it's good to be with you here today. We weren't really planning on being here, but here we are. Um, maybe you've heard me tell this before. When we were in seminary, we had a theology professor who one day in class, for discussion purposes, raised the question, is it appropriate to pray for rain? And the point being, the example he gave was in a small town, farmers needed rain because it had been a drought and they were praying hard for rain, but across town was a bride planning an outdoor wedding. <laughs> so is it appropriate to pray for rain? Uh, we've needed rain around here. I don't know that I prayed that it wouldn't rain today, but I was sure hoping it wouldn't rain today. So we could be at Camp Kirkwood after two years, but we'll do it another time. Glad you're here with us today, worshiping with us online through our live stream. It's good to be with all of you, especially as we come to the Lord's table. There's a lot of information in the bulletin about different things coming up in the life of this church. All of the information can be found online in our church newsletter, and the bulletin itself is posted online. So I call your attention to all of that. Two weeks from today, we are going to receive a special offering to benefit the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program and RINO, Rebuilding Hope in New Orleans, specifically for aid in recovering from Hurricane Ida. Um, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is a, has helped a lot of people in our church and in our county not just after Hurricane Ida, but particularly after, or not Hurricane Ida, but after Hurricane Florence, after Hurricane Floyd, after Hurricane Matthew, and many other times. I'm gonna show a video today, it's about a little over two minutes long, about Presbyterian disaster assistance in general. And you'll notice in the video that they talk about Presbyterian disaster assistance is long-term assistance. We're still receiving help from Presbyterian disaster assistance three years after Hurricane Florence. So that's where our offering will go to Rhino and PDA, and here's some information about Presbyterian disaster assistance. There are sounds that most of us love to hear. Sounds that elicit good feelings and images of joy. Happy birthday! Comfort. <laughs> Hope for the life ahead. But there are other sounds. Sounds that leave us with feelings of fear. Grief. Suffering. Throughout our country and in every corner of the globe, people just like you and me, with lives full of promise and hope, turn a corner to find life's greatest obstacles staring them in the face. They experience the kind of disaster that is beyond our comprehension. But that is where we come in. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance enables congregations and mission partners of the Presbyterian Church USA to witness to the healing love of Christ through caring for communities adversely affected by crisis and catastrophic events. When disaster strikes, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is there for the long-term recovery of those impacted. Long after the world has moved on, our blue-shirted volunteers in the U.S. and our ecumenical mission partners around the world are still there witnessing to the presence of God. Leading by example, serving those who need it most, restoring the promise of hope through the healing power of Jesus Christ. Elder Greg Moretti is leading worship today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all. 
I know we were all disappointed that we couldn't go to Kirkwood. I had already had out my shorts and my flip-flops and my Iowa Hawkeyes long sleeve t-shirt and my straw hat to wear to Kirkwood today, but Geneva made me dress up since we were having church inside. But isn't it wonderful that we can be together as a family and have this beautiful place to worship? And so thank all of you for being here. Please join with me this morning as we read our opening sentences. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. We come to worship hungry, Lord. We are hungry for comfort, hungry for love, hungry for a new way of living, hungry for your word. Thank you for giving us this place and this time to worship. We are eager to taste your goodness in community with our brothers and sisters. Bless us as we feast on the bread of life today. There's not a, a hymn listed in your bulletin today, but they are listed here on the wall. And our first hymn is 525, Let Us Break Bread Together. has called each of us by name even before our beginnings. Our Creator God has listened to our hearts and inspired within our minds a life renewed for the sake of His Son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the work in the Holy Spirit among us and within us, let us confess before God and one another the sins that are before us as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. I invite you to join me in our unison prayer of confession our responsive assurance of pardon, and our silent prayers. Let us pray together. Lord, we look for you in the wrong places. We put our trust in material things. We worry about things we cannot change. We wonder if you are even there at all. For all the times we have doubted you, Lord, forgive us. For all the ways we have neglected your word and ignored your people, forgive us. Do not be far from us, Lord. There is no one else we can turn to for help. Renew our fickle hearts and help us put our trust in you. Lord, hear our prayers. There is no wrong that God cannot make right. 
There is no chasm that can separate us from God's love. The Lord is patient and kind, generous and good. God will not forsake us or leave us. Let us turn to the Lord with confidence and put our faith in God's great mercy. By the power of Jesus Christ, we are made whole. Amen. Let us sing God's praises for His mercy in our lives. Please be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up and join me up here for the children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. If you can't see what I've got, you can look at that screen right there in a minute. I brought something here to show you today. First of all, I'll show you the, f the whole thing. This is something Miss Nancy has in her sewing cabinet, and it's what she sticks her needles in. She does a lot of sewing and a lot of making quilts, so she's really good at it. So I'm going to pull one of these needles out, and look at that needle. Look, you see? It, see, it's got a hole in it. It's kind of hard to see, isn't it? Because it gets out of focus. But you know, it's got. You know what that hole is called? Anybody know? It's called an eye. It's called the eye of the needle. And then, you, when you're going to sew, you have to take some thread. And I am not going to do it <laughs> because I am not good at it. So you take that real tiny thread and you have to stick it through that hole. And I can't do it very well. I can do it, but it would take me a really long time. Now, if Miss Nancy was up here, she'd go, whoop, it'd be right in there. She knows how to do it really well. But look how tiny it is. Look how tiny, you just can't really even see it. It's there. See, I can't do it, I can't get it through there. It's really hard to get through there. And look how skinny that th thread is, look. Yeah, now. It takes a lot of that to make the quilt, yeah. Now, I wonder if we could put this through the eye of the needle. What do you think? Let me get it out. You think we could make this fit through it? No. You know what that is? A camel. A camel, yeah. Now, you don't think we can do that? You can't? Can I put that through that hole? Why not? Too big. You mean there's it's too, n it's too it's rocky. Too hard. It's too hard. You mean there's no way I could do that? Yeah. Can you think of any way I could do that? I could make the hole bigger. I could make the hole bigger. <laughs> That'd have to be a Yeah, it could melt it down, maybe crush it up, but then we wouldn't have a camel anymore, would we? But how would you do it? How would you do it? Well, you know what? To take this camel and put it through that eye of that needle is impossible. There's no way I can do that. But God can do it. Yeah. Now, imagine a real camel. Now, I couldn't find a real camel, so I just brought this one. You know how big a real camel is? Big. Really tall. It's bigger than, it's bigger than the camel. Yes. So, one day, Jesus was talking to some people, and a man said, Jesus, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Jesus yep, yep. And Jesus said, well, you know the Ten Commandments, don't you? And he said, sure, and he named them. And the man said, well, I've done all that. I've done that all my life. And Jesus said, good, and he loved him. He said, well, you know, there's one other thing you've got to do. And the man said, what's that? He said, you need to sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and come follow me. And the man 
walked away. He said, well, he didn't say anything. He just walked away. He was very sad. And the Bible says he was very rich. He didn't want to give away everything he had. And some of the disciples said, Jesus, who in the world can be saved? Who can go to heaven? This is a good man. He's done everything God wanted him to do. If he can't get into heaven, who can get into heaven? And Jesus said, you know what? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for somebody to get themselves into heaven. Now, we've already agreed, right? It's impossible to make this camel go through that hole. And you can't put a real camel through the hole. And I bet the disciples were thinking, well, I guess that means nobody can go to heaven. But then Jesus said, well, you know, with people, it's not possible. But you got it right. With God, Jesus said, all things are possible. Now, if God can make a camel go through the eye of a needle, I think he can do that. I don't know how he would do it, but he's God and all things are possible. And I think what Jesus was saying is, magic. yeah, magic, yeah. Well, he's God. He, he knows how to do things that we don't know how to do and that we can't do. And I think that was Jesus' point to the disciples. They were worried that nobody could get into heaven. And Jesus was saying, you're right. You can't get into heaven if you're trying to do it on your own. If you think you can do something, that'll get you into heaven. But Jesus said, but don't worry. God can do it. Put your trust in God because God can do all things. So I think that's a good thing to remember. Sometimes when we think, God, I don't know how to do what I'm trying to do. I don't know how to do what you want me to do. We might get real frustrated. We might get angry. We might get sad. But we can remember that with God, all things are possible. Let's have a prayer together. Let's pray. Dear God, we don't understand how a camel can go through the eye of a needle. But we don't understand a lot of things, God. But we know that you are God, that you love us, that you care for us, that you have all good things for us. And so we trust you and we trust the Bible when it says that you can do all things. Lord, help us to always remember that. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming up. Please join me in our prayer for illumination as we get ready to read and hear God's Word. Let us pray. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hunger for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Job, chapter 22, verses 21 through 26. Please hear God's word. Agree with God and be at peace. In this way, good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored if you remove your unrighteousness from your tents. If you treat gold like dust and gold of the ophir like the stones of the torrent bed, and if the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to God.
I grew up hearing this gospel story I'm getting ready to read, referred to as the story of the rich young ruler. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, we find out that he was young. And in Luke, we find out he was a ruler. But he's not described that way in this story. Um, but I invite you to listen for God's word. Jesus is still on the road with the disciples. He's almost to Jerusalem. But he continues to teach them as he interacts with people. And this is another event from that journey to Jerusalem. Listen for God's word. That was, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of my favorite Jimmy Buffett songs is from the 1999 CD called Beach House on the Moon. The song is called A Little Spending Money, and it goes like this. Now, I'm not talking about excessive greed, the kind that puzzle the scribes and the Pharisees. I don't worship it like a golden calf, but change in my pocket's always good for a laugh. I've seen it brighten up the eyes of a child. It even makes the Dalai Lama smile. It's no relation to the meaning of life, but it's a dang fool husband who doesn't spring for his wife a little spending money. <laughs> money to burn. Money that you did not necessarily earn. Rainy days seem to wind up sunny as long as you got a little spending money. I got no financial conscience. Can't worry where it went. A lasting treasure or a moment of pleasure, worth it every cent. Coin or paper, baby, silver or gold, all denominations, nouveau or old. Can't have a turkey without oyster dressing. It's the root of all evil, the sum of all blessings. Don't need no armored car or time lock vault. Don't need no shaker full, just a few grains of salt. You may get by looking good and being funny, but life's a little less restrained with a little spending money. Money to burn, money that you did not necessarily earn. Rainy days seem to wind up sunny, long as you got a little spending money. Life's a little less restrained with a little spending money. But that begs the question, 
how much is enough? It is estimated that at the peak of his career, John D. Rockefeller was worth approximately $418 billion in today's dollars. Compare that to Jeff Bezos's fortune of $177 billion today. When Rockefeller was asked once, how much money is enough money? He replied, just a little bit more. And in a variation of the story, he was asked, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And Rockefeller answered, just one more dollar. Brad Stollery, a Canadian financial writer, posed this thought experiment. Suppose you're one of five people who have been selected by a mysterious philanthropist to participate in a contest. The five of you all have comparable debt levels and cost of living, as well as similar middle-class financial situations. You're all roughly the same age, equally healthy, have the same number of children, and you all live moderately low-risk lifestyles. Privately, a representative of the donor approaches each one of you one by one with a blank check and a pen and poses the following question. How much money would you have to be paid right here and now to retire today and never receive another dollar of income from any other source for the rest of your life? The catch is that whoever among the five players writes the lowest amount on the check will be paid that sum and the other four players receive nothing. The richest man in the whole county was sitting in the front pew at the last night of the revival. No one knew exactly how much he was worth but he owned a lot of businesses and property in town, in the county, in the state, and even across the whole country. And he made no secret of his wealth. He lived a very lavish lifestyle. When the usher handed him the offering plate, the rich man was suddenly overwhelmed, and he signaled to the organist to stop playing, and he stood up to face the congregation. And with tears in his eyes, he said, 40 years ago tonight, I sat right here in this pew at another revival, and I was convicted by what I heard. And when the offering plate came by, I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out the last and only dollar I had to my name, and I put it in the plate. I gave away everything I had, and look how the Lord has blessed me. And somebody in the back shouted, do it again. <laughs> The Sunday school teacher was talking to the boys and girls about the importance of generous giving. Boys and girls, she said, how many of you would give $50 to the poor? All the children raised their hands. The teacher was impressed. How many of you would give $100 to the poor? All the children raised their hands. So she tried again. How many of you would give $1,000 to the poor? All the children raised their hands. She asked, well, how many of you would give one dollar to the poor? And all the children raised their hands except one little boy named Billy. She said, why, Billy? You said you'd give fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, even a thousand dollars to the poor. Why won't you give a dollar to the poor? And Billy said, because I actually have a dollar. <laughs> then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, and who can blame them? Because riches and possessions were seen as blessings from God, blessings for your faithfulness. And if a rich man, blessed by God, who has kept all of the commandments since his youth, can't get into heaven, then who in the world can? Children, Jesus said, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So let's take Jesus' picture image literally, kind of like in the children's sermon. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. 
So who can be saved? That's what the disciples are asking. And although Mark doesn't indicate this, we can imagine Jesus looking at them and saying, guys, now you're starting to catch on. You can't do anything to inherit eternal life, the kingdom of God. Maybe the rich man's question was sincere. There's really nothing to indicate otherwise. What do I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, after all, Mark tells us Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus doesn't condemn his money. He doesn't condemn his riches. He doesn't condemn possessions in and of themselves in this story. But he does tell the rich man, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And when the man heard this, he was shocked, he was sorrowful, and he went away. But Jesus, I actually have many possessions. So no matter how admirable his motivation for coming to Jesus that day, it's as if he thought he could earn or buy his way into heaven, his salvation, either with his money or with the things that he did. And there's the rub for the rich man and perhaps for all of us. Jesus has this uncanny knack of taking questions and turning them upside down and inside out and posing them in a new way to the original asker. The rich man asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus ended up talking to him about using what he had to help other people. And then Jesus turned and taught his disciples about what it means to live in true community as one of his followers. As someone has pointed out throughout this whole section of Mark that we've been hearing from this fall, Jesus turns every encounter and every question into a teaching about the kingdom of God and what kind of behavior is required of those who want to enter into God's kingdom. It's what I've referred to as a life orientation to God. It's not a one-time thing. And we've heard it over and over and over again since the beginning of June, all the way back at the beginning of the summer. We heard it every week in the Sermon on the Mount. We heard it all through August in Paul's instructions to the Ephesian believers. And now as Jesus makes his journey to Jerusalem along the way, every week this theme keeps coming up about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Peter began to say to Jesus, look, we've left everything and followed you. On the one hand, Peter simply stating facts. Do you remember? Jesus said to Simon and Andrew, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. They left everything and they followed Jesus. But on the other hand, Peter might have been comparing himself and the other disciples to that rich man who had just walked away sorrowful. Look at us, Jesus. We're not like that guy. And it's almost as if you can hear the Apostle Paul's words, if I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. It's about our life orientation. And the question that comes up in Bible study and conversations always comes up in this, about this story is, did Jesus command only this man to sell all of his possessions, give the money to the poor, and follow him? Or does Jesus' command apply to every single one of us? And that's a tough question, because not many of us want to think that Jesus meant it literally for all of us. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And the comeback 
And I'm right there with you every time is, well, if we do that, then we'll be the poor. And the poor will have everything. Well, then they'll need to sell everything and give it to us, and it just never ends. That makes no sense. So how are we supposed to do that, Jesus? What are you talking about? So one way to handle that dilemma is to see the rich man's possessions as symbolic of whatever it is that gets in the way of your devotion to Jesus Christ. And actually, that's a pretty helpful interpretation. What in life are you so closely tied to that it's hard to be a faithful follower of Jesus on the way? But then again, this story about the man with many possessions hits pretty close to home, doesn't it? So much of our time, our money, our possessions, that's how we keep score in life. Either when we judge other people or when we rate our own self-worth. It's a funny thing, though. Why is it that when we compare what we have to what others have, we inevitably look at people who have more than we do and wish for that one dollar more rather than looking at people who have less than we do and giving thanks for what our many blessings and then using what we have to help those who have less. Last week I read this story on Facebook. Perhaps you saw it or maybe you've heard it before. One day a very wealthy father took his son on a trip to the country for the sole purpose of showing his son what it was like to be poor. They spent a few days and nights on the farm of what would be considered a very poor family. And when they returned home, he asked his son, how did you like the trip? It was great, Dad, the son replied. Did you see how poor people can be, the father asked. I sure did, the boy said. So what did you learn from this trip? His father asked. The son said, well, I saw that we have one dog and they have four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of our garden, but they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden and they have the stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard and they have the whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on and they have fields that go beyond your sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food, but they grow theirs. We have walls around our pr property to protect us, but they have friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. And then his son added, yeah, Dad, it showed me just how poor we really are. Jesus and the rich man. It's a tough story. But no matter how we choose to interpret it, the meaning is pretty clear, and it's the same thing that Jesus has been teaching his disciples and us all along the way to Jerusalem. Life in the kingdom of God is radically different from the life defined by this world. In fact, life in the kingdom of God may sound impossible. But there's the word of grace today. Not for God. For God, all things are possible. One final story. An American tourist in Jerusalem met up with a monk who offered to show him around the monastery. On the tour, they came to the monk's room. The tourist noted no TV, no radio, only one change of clothes, a towel, and a blanket. The man asked the monk, how do you live so simply? The monk answered, I noticed you only have enough things to fill one suitcase. Why do you live so simply? To which the tourist replied, well, I'm just a tourist. I'm only passing through. And the monk said, so am I. So am I. Let us pray. God of infinite patience and wisdom, we come to you with so many things that claim our time, our energy, our resources, our very lives. Help us to place our lives and our trust in you. Give us courage and strength 
to truly be your disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We see the gift that God has laid before us in the table, symbolizing the gift of God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. And as part of our preparation for coming to the table, we present our tithes and our offerings in gratitude to all the blessings that we have received from God. And thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we remember the grace, the mercy, the redemption won for us. We remember the cross. We remember the empty tomb. We remember our hearts burning and our eyes opening. We remember your promises. We remember the grace, the mercy, the redemption won for the whole world, the bread of life, the cup of salvation the gifts of God for God's people all over the world. We remember, Lord, as we give you thanks, 
with our lips, and with our lives. Amen. Let us affirm our faith as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus, the meal we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. We come to remember that Jesus was sent into the world to assume our flesh and blood to become God with us, that we might be redeemed. We come to have communion with this same Jesus Christ who has promised to be with us even to the end of the world. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of a new heaven and a new earth where we shall belong to God. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Here is the bread of life given for us. Let all who hunger come and eat. Here is the fruit of the vine poured out for us. Let all who are thirsty come and drink. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in the same manner, he took the cup, and after having given thanks and blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. Paul reminds us, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. As we have our great prayer of thanksgiving with the Lord's Prayer in our hearts, let us continue to lift up these people among all the other concerns that we all carry. Sympathy to Benjamin Bryce and his family on the death of Ben's wife, Sarah to Vera Simpson and Stanley Skidmore and their families on the death of their father, Stan Skidmore, the family of Laura Johnson, who died on Tuesday, the family of David Wood, who died on Thursday. We continue to pray for Linda Wells, Effie Mobley, Hill Lanier and his parents, Denny and Donna, Helen Glass, Molly Lowry, Cameron Lee, Shirley Carlton, and Merle Berenger. Let us pray together. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, our Creator. You have given us life and second birth in your Spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claimed Israel as your chosen nation. You raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection breathing into it your life and power. From worlds apart, you gathered us together. When we go astray, you welcome us home. Always your love has been steadfast. 
You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In love with you and in compassion for all, Jesus healed and taught, challenged and comforted, welcomed and saved. He formed a community promising to be with his disciples wherever two or three were gathered, sending them on his mission of hope and healing in the world. Jesus trusted his life entirely to you and went freely to his death so the world might be set free from suffering and sin. You raised him from death and you raise us also to live a new life with him. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you send us out to make disciples as he commanded. O oh God, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen. May you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be a communion of the body and blood of Christ. O oh God, you have called us together to be the church. Unite us at your table and in one loaf and a common cup, make us one in Christ Jesus. Let your spirit empower the life we share and ignite our witness in the world. With all who have gone before us, keep us faithful to the gospel teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Give us strength to serve you until the promised day of the resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. As Christ our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is a communion of the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. If anyone needs a communion kit, Greg can bring one to you, but let us now join in taking communion.
Let us pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 697. We're going to sing verses number 1, 4, and 6. nourishment of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us now go in peace to serve the Lord God in all that we think and do and say. May God's peace always be with us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.